Welcome everyone to our latest installment of Architrek. My name is Dwayne Haggerty and I'm President and CEO of Heritage Works. And our Architrek program is a partnership with the Dubuque Museum of Art. And um, as a lot of you are aware, um, our Architrek program is an opportunity for people to get out on foot to experience architecture up close in person and to hear some of the history of the architecture in the Dubuque region. Uh, with COVID, we have um, we have uh, planned our Architrek um, as a virtual event. So for the time being, we will do these, these video tours uh, rather than in-person tours. We hope um, in the future to continue our, our in-person tours. Today, our tour is the Dubuque Brewing and Malting Complex. Uh, the, the, the complex was constructed in 1895 and opened in 1896. So we will talk about some of the history of the complex and we will also show you uh, some of the interiors through photographs of the current condition of the complex as well as we'll show you many, many um, historic images of, of the complex and the surrounding area. Uh, we have with us today Jason Nysis who of course many of you have seen. He is our tour guide and he will take us around uh, the, the exterior of the building and we will also show you as part of this tour um, images of the interior, both historic and current images. So Jason, why don't you take it away? Sure. Uh, welcome everybody. So my involvement on these tours, um, I am one of the commissioners for the Dubuque County Historic Preservation Commission. So we see these tours as a great way to promote preservation and get some of the historical information that makes our city so unique out there to the public. Uh, we're thrilled to partner with Heritage Works and the Dubuque Museum of Art and other local partners to uh, tell these stories. So the complex that we'll be exploring today is a wonderful historic connection to uh, not only our historic architecture, but the history of brewing uh, and the history of beer in Dubuque. Uh, Dubuque has a very rich and checkered history uh, as, a, as it relates to brewing, uh, dating really all the way back to our founding as a city in the 1830s and 1840s when uh, the first settler, settlers in this area started to establish breweries. Um, starting at about the 1860s up to about the turn of the century, there were 17 different breweries that operated in Dubuque to supply not just our city but the entire tri-state area. Uh, the brewing activity in this area rivaled Milwaukee in the amount of production and its geographic scope that it reached. So that was pretty uh, impressive for a city of Dubuque size. Uh, not only was brewing a major industry in Dubuque, but it was also a big part of recreation and social life here. Uh, lots of bars and breweries had outdoor uh, beer gardens and pavilions and things where people would go uh, to escape the heat of the city. Uh, just, uh, just to the west of where we're standing right now along Central Avenue, there were trolley lines and things that took people out into uh, the countryside. And Union Park, which is not very far away from here, had big beer gardens and things. So the cultural culture around dr uh, drinking beer was a, was a big part of how people escaped the city and went out into the cooler parts of uh, the rural area. So the complex that we have behind us here, as Dwayne mentioned, uh, was started in the mid-1890s uh, uh, in how it was being conceptualized and then uh, as it was completed really became this wonderful architectural landmark for the entire north side of the city. Uh, largely around this area is residential. There is a little bit of light manufacturing around here but the establishment of this building uh, in this neighborhood really drew a lot of development to the area and when it was uh, designed, it was designed by an architect named uh, Louis Leela from Chicago, who was well, a well-known uh, brewery architect. And he designed this complex in the, Roman, uh, in the Richardsonian Romanesque style. So as we get closer, we'll see some of the details. But here from a distance, you really see some of the trademark uh, characteristics of the Romanesque style. So starting up at the top, you can see it's got some kind of rounded turrets on the corners of those large towers that are very characteristic of the Romanesque style. And a lot of the ornament that you see way up at the top is more stylized and modern than you would normally see in a traditional neoclassical building. Neoclassicism, when you think about Greek or Roman design, is right out of uh, the Beaux-Arts kind of uh, pattern book with, uh, like you think about typical Greek and Roman style with the big uh, triangular pediments and the dentils and the Corinthian columns and all those things. Here we have much more modern and stylized uh, types of, of ornament. 
So as you follow this down, you can see also right below the top of each tower, there are rounded arches, which is again, very characteristic of this style. This uh, building too, features lots of ornamental brickwork, which is very common in, um, in Romanesque architecture. So you can see that there are four small arches right at the middle of that tower. And at the, as those arches come down, those, the, the piers at the bottom of each arch come down unbroken. And the spandrel panel, which is uh, that horizontal uh, space above and below each window, is recessed into the building. So those unbroken piers going up really give this uh, building a heightened sense of verticality and, and, and uh, being a very tall uh, structure. As we go down uh, the building, you'll see at the base uh, huge blocks of rusticated stone that give this uh, building a real sense of solidity and strength uh, as it meets the ground. And as we get closer to the building, you'll see some really wonderful architectural details that Louis uh, Leela put into this building. So let's uh, go up and we're going to talk Excuse about me. each one of these spaces individually as we uh, as we talk about the functions that took place within each section, because that's a wonderful part of the history and the story of this structure. Before we talk about the architecture of the factory complex, let's first talk about some of the context that resulted in the construction of the brewery to begin with. The Dubuque Brewing and Malting Company complex is an artifact of the developments that occurred in the American brewing industry in the late 1800s. It's an excellent example of the type of brewery built for second generation German American brewers in the last two decades of the 19th century when brewing had become a large scale scientific industrialized and mechanized process greatly different from the cottage industry their immigrant fathers had entered into in the 1850s and 1860s. The complex is also uh, remarkably the result of the prohibition movement that was sweeping across many states throughout the country, including Iowa at the time. Iowa's attempts at prohibition began in the 1850s with the more rural populations favoring prohibition and the more urban populations, like Dubuque, being more anti-prohibition. As Jason mentioned earlier, Dubuque's German Catholic population had been drinking as part of its culture. As the 1800s progressed, there were four large brewing companies that had provided beer to the region. But by 1892, those large brewing companies merged together to form the Dubuque Malting Company. The purpose of the merger was to maximize the value of their ownership and to more easily compete with brewers from St. Louis, Milwaukee, and Chicago. Originally, the brewers intended to continue to operate at their original locations. However, they soon realized that their old, old facilities would not be able to keep up with the demand for the new product. So they planned for the new brewery complex with all the modern amenities for the time. In 1894, they closed on the purchase of several acres of land on the north side. Construction of the complex began in 1895. The new factory was designed as a large complex with a grand front facade made up of several adjoining buildings, each with its distinct purpose, and further buildings to the sides and back. The layout was optimized for efficiency of production the materials were engineered with strong floors and ceilings to support heavy machinery and tanks. Their plan would have a capacity to produce 150,000 barrels per year. The cost of construction exceeded 500,000. The work was completed and production began on January 1st of 1896. The brewery made two kinds of beer, a Wiener, which was a light palatable beer, and a Münchner, which was a dark, heavy beer. May 7, 1896 was announced as the open house for the new brewery and the entire public was invited to attend. The Dubuque Brewing and Malting Company was the largest brewery in Iowa and was in operation until January 1, 1916 when the Iowa Prohibition Law came into effect. This time, Dubuque's characteristic tolerance for alcohol did not allow its breweries to remain in operation. The complex never again opened as a brewery. As Jason mentioned, the uh, Chicago architect Louis Layla designed uh, the, the complex, and Louis Layla was an expert in brewery design. 
Um, he also uh, was an expert in choosing the location for the brewery complex. His philosophy was that the brewery complex should be located on a large plot of land that was flat, um, that would be close to a transportation corridor, the railroad on the east side of the, of the complex. It should also have its own water source. There was an artesian, I believe still an artesian well on the site that would have supplied fresh water for the production of, of the beer. And the way that the, the site is laid out is that the, pro the production functions are um, at the front of the complex along Jackson Street, and we'll talk about that um, later in the tour. The production functions are towards the front of the complex, and then the distribution functions, the bottling, the kegging, the racking, are all towards the back of the complex so that um, they could easily be distributed um, throughout the, the, um, the, the community. Um, one of the things Jason mentioned was, was that the, the architect was Louis Layla, but the local superintendent uh, of the construction was Fridolin Hare and Sons. And so there's, there's a little bit of confusion as to who the architect for the complex was, but clearly it was Louis Layla from Chicago who, who designed the, the, um, the complex and Fridolin Hare was involved in the construction of it. He was, Fridolin Hare was also involved in some of the additions to the buildings, but we'll talk about that later on. The new factory was designed as a large complex with a grand front facade that had multiple adjoined buildings with different functions. Uh, the, the portion of the building that we are looking at right now um, is the, the office and administration building. Um, it was all, all of this was built in 1895 and the, uh, the first floor would have been kind of what I would consider the retail um, the retail section of the complex where contractors and vendors would come here to do their business with the, with the, the factory owners. The second floor uh, contained offices and meeting rooms and conference rooms that would have been the offices for the administration. The third floor also had offices. Then above that was cold storage and just general storage rooms uh, for, for factory supplies. So up close to the building, we can really see some of the great, wonderful uh, Romanesque details uh, that Louis uh, Leila put in this structure. So right here, the most noteworthy feature that we see is this rusticated stone. And when we say rusticated stone, that is masonry where the, the, the rough surface of the stone actually extends out beyond the edge of the mortar. So anytime you see stonework that way, it's called rusticated. And a lot of Romanesque architecture has large rusticated stone right at the base. And what's noteworthy about this is if you look carefully, it's got this wonderful um, bead of colored mortar that just kind of gently joins and very really artfully done on each one of the stones that you see there. Uh, really a cool architectural detail that you only really see if you get up close. Another characteristic of this Romanesque style is stylized ornament. And in this period, uh, they were still doing a lot of ornament with carved stone. So right here at the base of each arch, you see a wonderful uh, 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 leaf type uh, ornament carved in. And especially over the top of this big flat arch over this large square window opening, you can see more of that carved stone right, uh, in, in those wonderful floral shapes. And at this point too, you really get to see how large these windows are at the base, which would have let a ton of natural light into this space. As Dwayne mentioned, this was a clerical space, an office space. So at that period, electric lights were very small and inefficient. So if you wanted to do your office work, you often needed to have your desk right next to a great big window to let in lots of natural light. Now, as we move over to this uh, wonderful arch, and this is a true arch, meaning that the stones that you see here were laid as an arch and they actually structurally hold each other up. Uh, this would have been where lots of the freight traffic and the wagons and things would have come through here. So at the base, they've got these giant carved pieces of stone that really uh, protect the arch from falling over if they would get hit by any of the wagons or the trucks coming in here. And as you go up, you can even see how some of the trucks maybe got a little bit too close to the arch. And we've got some scrapes and things on the inside of the arch. Um, a great wrought iron uh, sign holder here at the, at the right uh, at the keystone. And if you'll notice, if we can take a step back just a little bit, there is a D uh, for the Dubuque Malting and Brewing Company right at the top of this. 
and the, the D is carved into the stone. And on the right side of the stone, you have hops, like a, a stylized version of hops. And on the left side, you have grain. Grain and hops being the two main ingredients in beer. I also love the uh, wonderful uh, polychrome brick that you see uh, right alongside, or at the top of the arch. Kind of some cream colored brick right alongside some orange colored brick. Moving into the first floor of the interior of the office and administration building, you can see that this space was a public space used for uh, the, uh, carrying on the business of the brewery. As Jason mentioned, the large windows provided lots of natural light into the interior of the space. Because it was a public space, the interior was decorated very well with molded cast iron columns, embossed metal ceilings, cornices and friezes, and paneled walls and window surrounds. Now you'll get a glimpse of what the interior of the first floor currently looks like. Though many of the decorative finishes of the interior have been removed or damaged beyond recognition, there's still quite a bit of material left over. The decorative cast iron columns are still in place and there are remnants of the embossed metal ceiling details that could be replicated. Most of the window sashes are still in existence and a lot of the wood paneling has remained in place so that it can be either restored or replicated. As we move up to the second floor, this is where the boardroom and conference room would have been located on the south portion of the building. This room also has the decorative cast iron columns and large double hung windows which would have allowed lots of natural light into the space. The current condition of this space is similar to the condition on the first floor. Uh, there's been a lot of damage to the plaster resulting from water leakage, but all of the double hung windows are still there and the cast iron columns are still in place. The north end of the second floor contained the offices for uh, the administration of the brewery. It would have had the president's office, the secretary's office, and then other ancillary offices to support the administration. These spaces remain largely intact, although there's been a lot of plaster damage and water damage, but they do retain a lot of their original uh, wood trim finishes and other finished details that would be useful in a restoration. An interior wood staircase in the middle of the building leads from the second floor to the third floor, and the third floor contained more office and space for the administration of the factory complex. The third floor was finished more plainly, but did have decorative cast iron columns, which supported a ceiling. The ceiling on the third floor was unfinished, but it displays the structure of the building. The area above the third floor was used for storage. So the ceiling had to support the weight of the materials that would be stored. So the structure of the ceiling throughout the complex consists of cast iron columns that support steel I-beams the I-beam service floor joists, and in between the floor joists, there is a series of brick arches that give additional support to the floor above. As we move up to the fourth and fifth floors, you'll see that this is a double height space and that the walls are no longer finished with plaster. They're just uh, raw brick. This area was used for storage, so the double height space would have given flexibility to store any type of materials in this space. You will notice also the abundance of windows in this space to give it plenty of natural light. We're now moving on to the sixth level of the administration building, which has the rounded arched windows that Jason pointed out at the beginning of the video. This would have also been used for storage. And again, the large windows would have provided plenty of natural light into the space. We finally reached the uppermost portions of the Office of Administration building, which are the two corner turrets. The two corner turrets themselves have two stories. The first story has two rounded arch windows on each side of the turret. You then climb a ladder to the second story of the turret, and that is um, at the mansard roof level, and there's one window in the center of each side of the mansard roof. There's also a ladder that leads to the roof of each turret because there are flagpoles on the top of each turret. Our next building along Jackson Street was called the Machinery House. And this portion of the building housed 
the mechanical equipment for the production process. Um, one of the I innovations of the time was that it had uh, mechanical equipment for the production of ice. So you would have seen inside this building, it was a two-story space that it held the, the, um, the, the motors and engines for, for producing um, the, uh, the ice and also for producing some of the um, some of the power for the the brewery process. Um, again, I said the the first the first um, areas were two stories in height, but then above it again were some storage spaces. So here we get a really good look at some of the giant uh, limestone blocks that they used to, uh, to support this building. You can see how giant these were. And of course, Dubuque is pretty well known as a place where we have these large limestone quarries. So finding stones this large probably wasn't a, uh, a huge problem. But uh, so most of these are pretty rough hewn, but you can see that on some of them, it has some nice sharp incising on the edge of the stones to give it more added definition. And then as you proceed through on the building, they get larger. And, uh, but still giving that rough hewn, almost kind of organic feel coming up out of the earth. Uh, as we go up uh, on the surface of the building, more rusticated carved stone, more stylized ornament. Uh, some of these door openings still have their original wood frames. So you can see here, uh, kind of a little, uh, a little lunette right there at the middle of carved wood along with some of the original wood uh, framing uh, that still exists. So here on the machinery building, we've got a few other ornamental details that are kind of noteworthy, especially when you get up close. Uh, here at the bottom of this brick pier, there's a kind of a, there's a carved limestone cap right at the bottom with more of that stylized acanthus leaf motif. Um, as we move up too, uh, interestingly, we've got one of the windows that has not been boarded up. So you can see what the original factory windows would have looked like. Uh, six over six uh, divided lights uh, that would have had opening, uh, the sashes would have opened at the top and the bottom to let in lots of fresh air and natural light. So it's nice that we have one remaining that hasn't been boarded up so you can kind of see uh, what those look like. Uh, at the top of the building, right at the cornice line, that kind of horizontal piece right at the top of the building, there's some really cool ornamental, what we call corbelled brick. And corbelled brick is when uh, the bricks on top stick out over the top of the ones below and create a little ledge. So the corbelled brick um, adds a little ornamental interest. To just using regular common bricks, you can make more of a decorative uh, look. All the way at the top of the tower here, you can see that they also used uh, galvanized metal to uh, imitate what uh, they would have wanted to look like a carved stone cornice. But here, they use galvanized steel, and you can tell it's galvanized steel because it's rusting a little bit here in this use uh, over time and has not been maintained with a, a painted surface. As we enter the machinery house, you see more historic renderings of what those uh, ice making machines um, and other generating machines would have looked like um, when the, the factory was constructed. There are also some photos from 1912 that show workers in the factory here in the machinery house. So again, it shows some of the machinery equipment from that time period. We get to see what the space looks like now. And um, in the early 2000s, this portion of the brewery uh, was, um, had a small fire. And as you can see, the interior was uh, charred. Fortunately, because the building was constructed so well, only the contents inside the building burned and none of the building materials caught on fire. As we move to the third through fifth floors of the machinery house, you can see that these areas were used for storage of the manufacturing materials. Um, the finishes were, were relatively plain. Some of the walls were plastered and some of them with just the bare masonry finish. Okay. The final two buildings along Jackson Street was really the heart of the brewery complex. I'm standing in front of what was called the brew house. This is where the beer was brewed and on the inside there would have been these huge vats uh, that would have contained the beer for brewing and next to the brew house was called the mill house and this, this is the, the portion of the building that has the very tall tower. I believe it's seven to eight stories tall. At the top of the, the tower would have been a water tank, which would have been the water that was used in the brewing process would have been pumped up into 
the, the tank from the artesian well and then used in the brewery process. Also in the mill house, they stored the grain that was used um, in, as the ingredients for, for the brewing of the beer. Um, so again, this was probably the most important, uh, the important uh, part of the factory because this was really the money maker for the factory. Here at the base of the mill house, we have the original uh, wood door uh, that's still pretty intact. And you can see there's just lots of wonderful architectural details on that with the, the large cross braces that are kind of beveled on the edge and really gives it a really grand entrance. This is where um, grain wagons and things would have come in off the street to deliver uh, grain into the storage facility here at the mill house. This uh, tower also has a heightened sense of verticality. The vertical piers are unbroken all the way up and the horizontal spandrels uh, above and below each window are kind of recessed back in, really giving it a soaring presence. At the very top up there, you can see another one of these, wonder, one of these Romanesque arches at the top. And within that arch is a really lovely lunette window uh, with the original wood frame. Unfortunately, all the glass is broken out, but really um, once these uh, structures are restored, it'll be a wonderful kind of beacon that showcases some of the uh, architectural grandeur of it. We also have here more of those stylized uh, vegetation at the bottom of this arch. Uh, these are a little bit bigger than some of the ones we saw up on the administration building but great craftsmanship here and great architecture. Inside the brew house, we first get uh, a view of some of the historic renderings of the interior of the brew house when it was in operation. You can see that on the first floor of the brew house uh, that shows the vats and the tanks, uh, notice also that there is an interior stairway that rises from the first level of, of the building to the top of the building. The stairway has fairly elaborate wrought iron balustrade and railings. The images we see here are the first through the third levels, and you can see that some of the areas are uh, two stories in height with mezzanines in between. Now we see what the first through third levels of the brew house look like today. Um, most of the area is still two stories in height, but the stairways have been removed, and you, but you can see remnants of where the stairways once existed. Later on in the tour, we'll see where some of those um, uh, wrought iron balusters and stringers and railings ended up. But uh, one of the other th interesting features of the brew house is that the walls were finished um, in plaster, but not only were they finished in plaster, but they were then scored to look like smooth cut limestone. I think this has one, uh, several reasons. One was that they wanted a, a very sanitary surface for the production of beer, but then also they wanted a nice finished look for, uh, for this area of the factory complex. Moving on to the fourth floor, we see another historic rendering of what the interior looked like, and we get a, a very nice view of the ornate um, stairway along with the cast iron columns. A current view of the fourth floor shows again that the stairway no longer exists, uh, but the cast iron columns are there, and the stairway would have been in between those four cast iron columns. Now we move to the top floor of the brew house, which is the fifth floor. It shows the top of the cast iron stairway, um, and it also shows the arch top windows that are at the top of the facade of the brewery. You can also see more clearly that the walls were finished with the plaster finish uh, with a scored finish to look like cut limestone. The interior of the fifth floor is a vaulted space with a hip roof the current images of the space show the uh, vaulting of the roof clearly along with the rounded arch windows. And then you can also see uh, the finish of the walls still has the plaster finish with the scored effect. The ceiling of the space also has an interesting truss system. Capping off the roof would have been a massive skylight or what's also known as a roof monitor. The roof monitor is no longer there, but I believe that it was dismantled and moved just south to um, cover the roof over the machinery building. Moving into the interior of the mill house, we only have one historic rendering showing the interior. This image shows the character of that part of the building as a storage area and a milling facility. We see the existing condition of the mill house. On the first floor, we see the back of those massive doors that Jason pointed out earlier. On the second floor, we see uh, the boarded up windows 
You'll also note that the finish of the interior uh, did not have a plaster finish, but a painted brick finish. We also see some of the storage areas. You see uh, the areas for shelving, and again, you see more of the windows. As we move up in the mill house, we see some of the remnants of the industrial use. Here's a fire door that uh, separates some of the areas of the brewery. Uh, but then as we get up to about the fifth level, we see the lunette window that Jason mentioned outside. Um, from here, there's a stairway that then leads to where the water tower or where the water tank is located. And the water tank is, is still at its original location in the building. Uh, we move then higher up into the tower. The stairway takes you to kind of the upper portions of the tower. So we're above the water tank and we're just below uh, the tent roof. Those boarded up windows are the kind of the, the windows that you see toward the top of the building. Uh, now we are in the area where uh, we're directly underneath uh, the roof. In this area, we get to see uh, the roof trusses and the roof decking. So that takes us to the end of the mill house. Hey, as I mentioned that uh, the design of the complex was that the more utilitarian aspects of the complex would have been uh, kind of east of Jackson Street. And so here on 30th Street, along 30th Street, was the, um, the cold storage uh, facilities. And this is where they would have stored the, the finished uh, beer, beer kegs. And um, originally the, the first cold storage facility was built closer to, the, to, to Jackson Street in 1895. But then over the years, there were more um, storage facilities added. And those, those uh, buildings were designed by Fridolin here, constructed in uh, the early 1900s. Uh, they're very, kind of, as you can see, uh, very plainly designed. They still had you know, some of the, the Romanesque details with the segmented arched, uh, or the, the round arched uh, window openings and segmented arched window openings. Um, also, you can see, um, you know, portions of this building had collapsed. There was a, a very torrential rainfalls in the summer of 2016 that, um, that saturated the roofs of this portion of the complex. And because of that weight, the roofs kind of pancaked on top of each other and caused the collapse of the building. But as a result of that, we can see kind of the structure of the cold storage facility. You'll see that it, it is, it did have uh, some steel frame construction along with load-bearing uh, brick masonry. But also we can see at the, at the, the, the portion that is, is kind of um, demolished that you can see how the, how the floors were structured. Uh, they had uh, steel kind of joists, but then in between those joists, they had rounded brick arches that would have provided additional um, support for the floor so that they could hold the weight of the heavy kegs and the machinery that they were using for bringing those kegs in. There was some selective demolition done to take it down to a point where it's believed to be safe. Uh, but you can see, you can see in this area just how thick the walls were and how these brick walls were constructed. Um, all of this could be restored in a restoration. Um, brick walls can be reconstructed. It just, you know, this is a very extensive um, damage to this building. In 1918, after the brewery closed, uh, the next owners put an addition onto the back of this building to provide more storage space. But by the time they got to 1918, uh, technology had changed and the construction of these large warehouses had changed. So instead of building this with a uh, steel frame with brick clad, this is actually a reinforced concrete frame. And you can see that express right out onto the surface. That white grid is reinforced concrete filled in with brick. Uh, this became a very common style in this era, like the 1918 era. Uh, some of the later buildings that were built in the Millwork District in Dubuque on the Novelty Ironworks uh, building also used this grid of reinforced concrete for some of the large storage facilities. We're now walking from the rear of the complex into the interior courtyard uh, behind the buildings that we looked at um, earlier in the tour. So this area would have had a railroad spur that extended off of the main line into the interior of the factory complex. This would have brought materials into the interior of the courtyard to drop off in the areas such as uh, the machinery house, uh, the boiler house, the racking room, and the wash house. As we proceed through the courtyard, you can see 
that the architecture is much uh, more plain and less ornate than um, as shown in the architecture along Jackson Street. Uh, but again, this was uh, meant to be kind of the working area of the factory. And so it's not surprising that the, the brickwork and the, um, the decorative um, features of the building would have been more plain. Now we're in the courtyard of the brewery complex, and this would have been the heart of the, the, the complex. There would have been a railroad spur that would have run into this, this complex. There would have also been an opportunity for wagons and vehicles to come in through the arch on, on Jackson Street. Uh, this would have been a beehive of activity. Uh, behind me is the what's called the boiler house, and that is where the, the boilers were for the production of steam and hot water that would have been used both for the brewery process and for heating the buildings in the wintertime. There would have been a large smokestack that would have extended up um, above the, the tops of the brewery um, that was uh, at one, it was, uh, we believe it was demolished sometime after World War II. Um, <clears throat> you see the backside of the machinery house and, um, and the, the, the brew house. When I mentioned before, the brew house was uh, of course a multi-level space that had interior staircases that allowed uh, people from move from, to move from one level to the other on the interior of the building. When the brewery closed after Prohibition um, and the use of the building changed, all of those stair stairways were taken out of the interior of the building. But then there wouldn't have been any way to get from, uh, from floor to floor. So after that point, they built this large stair tower um, in order to get from, from one floor to the next. And when you go inside that stair tower, they actually have the balusters and the stringers for the stairs that they use to build this, this, new, this new stairway. Um, so they reuse those, those stairway uh, materials that they, uh, that they removed from, from the brew house. The next building that we'll talk about in the courtyard is the building to the right of me, which was called the racking room. And this building, uh, again, is a pretty utilitarian design with uh, double hung windows with segmental arched window tops. But this is where the kegs were filled and that's, that was called the racking process. And the kegs were laid on their side and there was a hole at the top of the keg, it was called the, the bung hole. And uh, the, the beer was, um, was filled into the bung hole and then the bung, which was the plug, was hammered into the bung hole. And then that keg then was moved um, um, on a rack, which was, was why it was called racking. And um, further to the east was called the washroom. And that is where the kegs and other equipment used in the manufacturing process were washed and, and sanitized. And that was originally a two-story building, but um, at some point there was a third story added onto it. And you can see that because the brick has a slightly different color to it. You can see at the top of the second floor, the brick is a little bit lighter in, in color. And um, the, one of the things that I read too was that the washing washroom was also where um, they, they washed the, the used yeast to use it over again in the, in the brewery process. This was what was known as the keg shed, uh, which was uh, originally part of the, uh, the original brewery complex. Uh, this would have been a loading dock, a covered loading dock, which would have held uh, the uh, unfilled kegs when they were loaded and brought in for the production process. Um, the, this is all steel construction. You can see some of the, the truss work. Um, and, and this is left over uh, from the brewery complex. It, of course, has been, been uh, covered. Okay. Behind me, we have uh, the, the wagon shed and the stables that were a part of the original 1895 construction. And this is toward the rear of the complex. And of course, in 1895, uh, the transportation would have been by horse and wagon. And so they had a whole stable full of horses and wagons that would have delivered beer product to, to um, uh, vendors in Dubuque and, and, uh, and residents of Dubuque. Um, the wagon shed originally had a, it was an open shed, so it was a, a structure which we'll see uh, behind it later on, but there was an open shed roof that would have allowed for wagons to be driven into the wagon shed and then, and then unhitched so that the, the, um, the horses could then go into the stable. 
um, sometime after the, the closing of the brewery, the wagon shed was closed in with this kind of brick facade. We believe it was probably in the 1920s, 1930s. And, um, and then, um, the, so then the, the wagon shed and the stables were combined together. We're standing here in front of the stables, which was right next to the wagon shed, right to the north of the wagon shed. And this would have housed the, the horses and other, um, other stable equipment. Um, one of the things on the facade and in uh, the historic images, there was a larger opening on the second floor, which would have been the hay mound for, for storing of hay for, uh, for the horses. But since when it was no longer used as a stable, some of those openings were filled in with windows. Um, after, uh, ar around World War II, this site was purchased by H&W Trucking Company and used for for the headquarters for their company and also for, of course, storing their trucks. This was the location of the offices for the H&W Company up until they closed um, in the early 2000s. So right now we're at the back of the, the stables, um, at the east side of the complex. You can see the, the construction of the stables is very, you know, very much like the rest of the buildings on the complex, the red brick, the limestone block foundations, the wood double hung windows. Um, as we move further to the south, uh, you can see the back of what, what we talked about, the wagon shed. So this would have been the structure uh, for the wagon shed, again, kind of um, incorporated into the east facade of the stables. Uh, this would have housed the wagons. So this was the east side of the, the factory complex. And as we talked about before, um, the, the factory complex was served by the Chicago Great Western Railroad that ran through here. This was the line of railroad that ran through. There would have been a spur coming off that railroad that would have gone both into the, the interior portions of the complex, but then also come alongside of these loading docks. Um, as we move down to the bottling plant, it would have um, picked up product from the bottling plant, also opportunity to leave product for the bottling plant. So this was the way that raw material would have entered uh, the complex and also exited the complex. The bottling plant was built on the far eastern edge of the malting and brewing complex here uh, because again, the bottling was right next to the railroad spur uh, and the railroad line that came through this way so the finished product could be loaded right onto the trains. Uh, Louis Leela, who was the architect for the entire complex, uh, designed this as part of the original uh, building. So this, these middle two bays, these two bays, and the two bays flanking the middle part were part of the original 1895 uh, structure designed by uh, Leela. And you can see they're characterized by a lot of the same architectural details that we saw on the original complex with the corbelled brick at the start, some unbroken piers coming down, the wonderful uh, segmented arches atop each window. The rest of the complex that you see down uh, extending further west was added on about 10 years later, uh, designed by Frittle and here, but you can see that the architectural details are mimicked all the way down. The, uh, although they're all boarded up, you can see that some of the larger openings would have been loading docks where horse-drawn wagons could have pulled up and been loaded or unloaded there. And there was a, a cobblestone uh, paved driveway here that is lined on this street side by giant blocks of stone. You can kind of see how big they are. So these kind of would have buffered, you know, keeping water and things from buffering up into the cobblestones and keeping the cobblestones from kind of moving outward. But these things are huge. And these all would have been originally, they, and they line the entire uh, block here alongside the bottling building here. So we're now at the end of, of our tour of what you can see is a massive um, historic industrial complex, industrial brewery complex. And um, uh, it is uh, going to definitely be a large preservation challenge. The complex is owned uh, currently by two separate owners. Uh, the, the western portion of the complex is owned by one owner and the eastern portion of the complex is owned by another owner. The owner of the western portion is currently in the process of planning for a rehabilitation of the entire portion, that um, entire portion of the complex. Uh, the plan is that it would be mixed juice, uh, retail, commercial on the ground floor, and then residential um, on the upper floors, uh, upwards of 100 apartments. <clears throat>
and um, as you can see, there's been you know some pretty pretty substantial damage uh, to to the property. But um, the with the historic tax credit projects, those those portions can be brought back um, and restored. Um, because of the tax credits, the, the building will be restored according to the historic standards. So a lot of the, all of the architectural details, all of the architectural character uh, will be restored and retained as part of the, of the restoration. Uh, we're currently in the process of working through a National Register nomination uh, for, for this, uh, this whole site. Um, we, uh, the, 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 tax, the first part of the tax credit process has been approved. It has been deemed a certified historic structure. Um, and so, so there is, you know, there is a movement on the restoration of the complex. Because of the size of it is going to be not only um, very costly, but it's also going to be very time consuming. This is not something that will be done in a few short years. It will take a number of years. Uh, to get this complex restored. But it is one of the most important um, architectural complexes, not only in Dubuque, but the state of Iowa. It displays a history of, of the brewery history in the state of Iowa, um, and you know also uh, the architectural history with the beautiful Romanesque revival architecture. Um, so uh, Jason, do you have anything to, to add before we end? Well, this building is obviously an architectural icon for the entire north end. It really is a symbol. You can see it from all over this neighborhood. So the fact that there is a restoration plan and that there are resources being devoted to keeping this as not just an architectural icon or a, a visual reminder of the history of this uh, neighborhood, but it's also just a great symbol of uh, the history of our city as well, the history of brewing, the history of industry, the history of uh, the development of this whole north side. So uh, I'm encouraged by the plans that they have to restore the building and so just keep your eyes on this project and keep cheering on the folks who are taking on this giant task. So thanks everybody for tuning in and we hope to see you on the next Architrek virtual tour. Thank you.